Uh, All right, we're in the middle of our study of Philippians chapter 4, looking at worry and anxiety. Have you stopped worrying yet? I mean, we're two two sermons into it. I got a thumbs up over here. Worry's done. Killed it. It's over. I handled it. I don't even need the next two messages. I'll use them to give to somebody else. So that's good. We're going to look at one verse today. Steve, how are you going to preach on one verse for 40 minutes? Well, you haven't been to our church before. Uh, So welcome. Hey, if you are new, my name is Steve, one of the pastors here. So thrilled you're here. Uh, You picked a great week to join us as we look at worry. Man, we said when we started this series, uh, man, there's a lot of things you could worry about. Amen? Man, there's a lot of things happening in a lot of people's lives and a lot of what you're reading in the media and news and on Facebook and, you know, everything else, social media. And boy, worry is just a constant temptation nowadays. So we said, let's spend some time meditating and kind of do a group counseling session on worry. Uh, We're going to look at a verse today that hangs in uh, the bedroom of my daughters. Uh, I have six kids, uh, five daughters, one boy. Uh, He is the lone boy who has four mothers and two younger sisters. He's in a very unique situation. Uh, But oftentimes, as our kids have gotten older and their imaginations have gotten more active, uh, we have the conversation around bedtime about things that they're worried about. Worries for them have a tendency to come out when they're tired, when they're scared, when they're fearful, when things are going on in their life and they get to the end of the day and all of sort of their composure melts away. Uh, And I have had this conversation on the stairs in my house where my curls will come down or my wife will have this conversation uh, and we will talk about what is the thing that you are thinking about? What is the thing that is capturing your attention right now? We have a good family friend who, is a kind of as a painter and an artist, and she painted this uh, canvas for them that hangs in their room. And what hangs in their room is Philippians 4, verse 8. So if you got a Bible, go to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at one little bitty verse, 4, verse 8. Uh, and I, as you do that, as you turn to find in Philippians, I also want you to find Matthew chapter 6. We've looked at this text, Matthew chapter 6, last week when we talked about prayer uh, and anxiety and the way that the Bible talks about worry and anxiety. And one of the densest places in your Bible that brings up that word is also Matthew chapter 6. So I want to show you something from Matthew chapter 6 to, to get your mind going uh, on what we're going to see here in, um, in Philippians chapter 4. So we started this series looking at praise. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Remember that? And we said that our praise and our worship is our preparation for seasons of worry. As we're growing in our understanding of who God is and what he is like, uh, that's, your, that's your spring training. And then uh, last week we said, uh, to continue the sports analogy, we said when you're in the game, Monday morning happens, you're in the game and something's going on at work, something's going on in your family, something's going on in your parenting, in your finances, something like that. You're practicing these in-game realities where you are bringing those things to the Lord. As much as you worry, you need to be working that opposite muscle and uh, pray in. And that's what we said. Well, we, we looked at Matthew chapter 6 to talk about uh, how Jesus talks about worry, uh, to capture our, our attention in the way he thinks about it. And I want to pull out just one more big idea that's going to frame up what we're going to look at here today. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Y'all there? Matthew 6, 25. This isn't on the screen. This is for free. This is extra at church as you've got to do a little bit of work uh, with your Bible. Look at Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, here's what I want you to see in these next. I'm going to give you two big words in this paragraph that I want you to circle and highlight so you understand what Jesus is saying. Verse 26, look, circle that word, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Verse 27, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? Verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider, I want you to circle that word, consider. The lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Uh, Commonly speaking, when it comes to our spiritual lives, when you talk to people about faith, a lot of people will consider that faith is sort of this leap into the dark, that people who are spiritually minded uh, do sort of a mental sleight of hand when it comes to their problems, their troubles, their worries. And that's the farthest thing of what 
faith and spirituality is in the scriptures. Faith and spirituality in the scriptures are always tied to content. That there's certain things that the Christian will lay his mental hands on and take hold of in situations across life. And Jesus will highlight these things. We looked at uh, Jesus being in the boat in the sea and the storm at Galilee, and he asks the disciples, oh, you of little faith, right? And he calms the wind and the waves. And the disciples are learning uh, in their theology. They're putting their hands, their mental hands on truth that is now going to guide and form their life. And this is a consistent scriptural theme all throughout the New Testament, that faith is not just this blind assessment of things, but faith takes into account spiritual truths that allow you to move through life in a particular way. You with me? That that's, that's how faith works for us. That there are certain truths for the Christian that we lay hold of. So let me give you some examples of this. And, and they're all around this idea of what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6. That you are to look. You are to consider. That fundamentally faith is a thinking person's game. We're considering some things about God and who he is and about creation and who we are and the problems in our lives and whether or not we're facing sin or struggle or disappointment or suffering. What we're doing is engaging that reality with a thinking perspective. Let me give you an example. Here's Romans 8, 5. You can just jot these down. You don't need to, um, you can look them up later. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Two ways to think. Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Colossians 3 says, set your minds on things that are above, not the things that are on earth. Hebrews 5, one of my favorite passages on what maturity looks like as a Christian. The author of Hebrews says this, about this we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Matthew 22, he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That faith is fundamentally a thinking thing. We don't close our eyes to Uh, suffering, difficulty, hardship, belief, and unbelief, that we engage those things as Christians, that we take seriously the mental, arduous task of doing the work to distinguish good from evil, right from wrong. You with me? That's work in the Christian life. Am I right, Christians? Amen, that that is work. So if we started with spring training, We talked about being in the game. Today, I'm going to talk about your mental diet. Do athletes need to eat a certain kind of things? You ever been to um, like a Chinese buffet where you walk through the Chinese buffet and you've got chicken wings and you've got, you know, king crab and you've got brownies and you've got, you know, everything. Addison, you with me? Where's that? You've got what on a stick? You've got chicken on a stick, says Addison. Would, would you agree that everything that is edible is not necessarily healthy? You with me? That when you think about diet, not everything you can eat, you ought to eat. And what we're going to look at today is what should the mental diet be for the Christian? What does Paul say we ought to saturate our thinking with? So Philippians 4, 8, if you're not there, turn over there. Philippians 4, verse 8, I'm going to simplify the whole sentence for you into a subject and a verb and a direct object. Remember direct objects? All the English teachers are so excited I'm using these, this terminology. My kids at home will go, I know what a direct object is. Uh, here's, here's this sentence. 
If you take all of Philippians 4, verse 8, and compress it down, it says this, brothers, think on these things. It's a command. Brothers, think on these things. Now, the question you and I have, and what Paul gives to us, is what are the these things? What ought I to saturate my thinking with? Before you worry, you think, right? That thinking precedes the worrying. Uh, I'll say this later. Let's, uh, why don't we do this? Let's pray, and then we'll talk about what's in this text here and how we can discover what Paul thinks the Christian's mental diet ought to be, all right? Father in heaven, thanks for your word that we have already spoken here this morning from Psalm 100. Psalm 145 says that the Lord is good, and his mercy is over all that he has made. So, Father, for those of us who come in this morning and are discouraged or despairing, who are worried, who are anxious, who feel the pressure of a certain situation that they don't know how to handle, they don't know how to go forward with, I pray this morning that this would train our minds for righteousness, that you would use this to advance our maturity, that we, as a result of these few minutes together, might have our senses constantly trained to distinguish good from evil, right from wrong, the pure from the impure, the truth from lies, that you would give us the courage and your spirit to be able to engage uh, the things that we encounter in this life and that we would hold to the standard of your word. Father, for those warriors and sufferers who come in and are watching online who are here among us, I pray that these realities might begin to reframe and become the pillars on which they stand when they think. Father, we need to be reformed, we need to be changed, we need to be shaped, that worry is such a common temptation for us. We pray that you would give us the discipline to discipline our minds. As the scriptures say, that we would discipline our minds for godliness. Father, we are dependent on you and your spirit and your word. I pray that uh, the meditations of our heart and the words of our mouth would be pleasing in your sight. Oh God, our rock and our redeemer, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so here's what I want us to, to think about here as we're beginning. Um, when we talk about our spiritual lives, Jonathan Edwards was a, a, um, an early American theologian, and he wrote a book called Religious Affections that really wrestled with how do I discern what a true move of God is? Is it just what people say? Are there um, certain markers that we can talk about when we understand when God is truly moving in somebody's life? And when when he wrote that book, he had to figure out and get underneath all of the expressions that were happening religiously into what was happening in the heart. And one of the things that's incredibly encouraging about that book is he does a great job at understanding how our hearts work. And, And we've started really in this series looking at where the battle lines are drawn. And we talked about this from Psalm 131 that that said uh, our hearts are the things where worry takes hold and grabs us. And when Edwards writes about this, he says that there are two, he doesn't take the, the common understanding of who we are, of mind, will, and emotion. He boils it down to actually two big ideas that he calls uh, understanding and inclination. Now, I've said this before in our church that you and I, no matter how austere or stone-faced you are, are always worshiping. You're always entering into life and relationships and vocations and schooling and all of those things, having a default in your heart that is saying, this is wonderful, this is distasteful. This is worthy of my attention and affection. This is not. You're always distinguishing. You with me? You're always doing those things in your heart and making decisions about how you ought to operate in life. That the foundation of life for us in terms of who we are as humans is always connected to things that we love. But our loves, according to Jonathan Edwards, are always informed. That's where our understanding comes in. So he understands, and we understand, that I can't love correctly unless I know correctly. We have a duty and an obligation to lead our hearts, right? As we've said that over the past couple weeks. Well, we also have a duty and an obligation to inform our minds. Because it's our apprehension and understanding that begins to inform the deepest parts of who we are and the things that we love. You with me? You got that? 
So that's super important as we start, that they're connected in the previous verse, right? That the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That's the good news of prayer, that prayer deals with both our understanding and our affections, our understanding and our inclinations, our desires that pull us. But those things have got to be informed. So this is the discipline of the Christian life. I had a a mentor, a guy who said, uh, the Bible does not yield its fruits to the lazy. You remember that? Remember hearing that? Andrew and I both had the same, the same kind of mentor, and I went, oh, man, I should think a little bit harder. So here's what Paul is going to do for us. He's going to tell us this is how we ought to think. This is one of my pet peeves in Christian ministry, generally speaking, and with Christians around the world, is that typically we haven't spent enough time thinking biblically about issues and circumstances. So this is how we do it. You're going to see uh, Paul give you a list, and the list is broken into four and to four. Okay? He's going to start pure and objective in the first four. And then he's going to move into subjective. He's going to move into areas where there's public acclaim and public commendation and public approval. So we're going to start with objective things that we would all look at and go, those are the standards. And then he's going to look at how this engages our culture and our relationships and uh, what happens in our society at large. All right? Let me start. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers. Now, worry, I've said this, you know, a couple times in this series, worry has a tendency to isolate us. It has a tendency to make us handle life in our own head. But one of the things that you wouldn't readily see in Philippians chapter 4 is that all of the verbs and the commands that Paul has used in the first several verses that we looked at are all plural verbs. They're y'all verbs, for lack of a better term. You with me? So it's a reminder here that when Paul begins to now write this list of things we need to think about, that we need to think about we. How are you going to come alongside a worrier? If you're in a season where you're not worrying, how are you going to help and serve and love a brother or sister who is worrying? Well, Paul frames this up for for us here that Uh, we are meant in our Christian lives to journey together. And that is so essential for anxiety and worry. Listen, we live in a culture that primarily advances this subtext that you are meant to go and accomplish your dreams, visions, goals, and desires according to your own perspective and agenda. So as a result of that, is it any surprise that one of the major issues in our culture is worry and anxiety? Because we get one of the, you know, one of the many things that I think is dangerous about the internet, and I could, there's lots, right? But one of the things that uh, is dangerous is that it advances the agenda that your particular perspectives are informed on your own is that you don't come to opinions in our culture very often in the context of relationship with others. You come to resolute opinions on your own by your own reading, right? Things that fit with your agenda and your perspective that you agree with. And what Paul is saying, brothers, is that this kind of mental diet needs to be eaten together. You with me? That, that we need to engage the truths of this text together. That the truths that Paul is about to talk about here need to form our preaching and our singing and our discipling and our corporate reading of God's word. That when you come and engage with the life of the church, that what you are doing just by being here and singing and speaking and listening to the preaching of God's word is countercultural because you are now a part of the family of God to where your understanding is being shaped as you listen to people sing the truths of God's word next to you. You with me? As you leave this place and discuss, this is how God's word is forming and pressing on me, and I am discussing that with other people. That Paul recognizes that our corporate growth toward maturity needs to be in the context of relationship. Does that make sense? That we come in here with all sorts of worries and all sorts of convictions and all sorts of things that are on our heart, but for a moment, for the hour or so that we're here, we are shoulder to shoulder singing and speaking and praying the truths of God. And that's forming us. 
It's forming our church toward maturity and growth and uh, spiritual fruit as we journey in relationship together. That's why it's so important for you to be connected to a local church, is that we have a tendency in our culture to say that it's me and Jesus. I don't really need the church. I don't need to show up. I don't need to sing. I don't need to pray. I don't really need to give. I just need to go to that experience on Sunday and then get encouraged and go out and live my life on my own. And Paul, that's the furthest thing from Paul's mind, that Paul recognizes it's y'all, it's us, it's the we together, amen? Amen. That we do that. So he frames it up and reminds us again, I've been using plural verbs, but finally, brothers, sisters, here's what we ought to be thinking about. Here's what ought to characterize the mental diet and therefore the conversations with one another that we ought to have. Would you agree that Christians speaking to Christians, churches and communities ought to be different in their conversation than the world? Is that too much to ask? Do you think that's crazy? I think that if we have the risen Savior, who is Lord of heaven and earth, that that's something we ought to be talking about. Okay. Man, I'm about to go sideways. All right. You with me? So here's, what he, here's, your, here's your first four objective ones. This one is first for a reason. I think in Paul's mind, you don't get much further in this list unless you have this first one. Finally, brothers, whatever is what? true. Whatever is true. Um, This is all throughout the New Testament. Jesus talks about himself as being the true vine, as true bread from heaven. Uh, John 17, he says, uh, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus will say of himself in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Ephesians 4 says that the truth is in Jesus. If you look up the definition of truth, which you may or may not have done recently, the definition of truth typically says something like that, those things which are true, which I don't think is fair. If you, if you work for the dictionary company, uh, fix that for me, please. Nobody's asked me about that. But about definition two or three, the definition of truth is that which corresponds with reality. Now, that's a much better definition of truth in my opinion because when Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life he locates truth in himself as the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power as the one who determines what is real and true what is authentic what he defines reality so when Paul begins this list here he begins with those things that are objectively true this is not a matter of opinion in Paul's mind he says that you and I as those who follow and trust and love and serve the Lord Jesus now begin to make um, distinctions about things that are true and things that are false, things that are right and things that are wrong, things that are deceptive and things that are true. You know, our culture has has a riptide in it right now. Have you felt it? That our culture has a riptide that moves towards subjective determinations of truth. That I'm allowed to determine my own future, my own identity, my own preferences, my own ambitions, my own dot, 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 you fill in the blank. But Paul calls us back to make sure that as we go down this list, and this list is going to get broader and broader in the way that he uh, talks about it, that the fountain, the spring of all evaluation for the Christian should come back to not what feels good or not what works. We have those temptations? That a lot of the pull in our culture is toward, does that feel good? Does that make me feel affirmed? Does that fundamentally work? Does that advance my agenda or my ambition or my career? If so, I'd like to go forward in that path. But for the Christian, it's something different. The Christian goes back to not does it feel good, not does it work, but is it true? Does it correspond with reality. Before you evaluate what follows, lovely things, commendable things, things that are excellent, things that are praiseworthy, Paul has got to make sure that you understand the things that are true. Keep your finger there in Philippians. Turn, let me show you this in action for Paul. Paul deals with false teachers, uh, false apostles in the Corinthian church. Turn to 2 Corinthians 10, and he talks about it in the context of the truth creating division. People will say, well, the truth divides. Well, of course it does. It divides truth from error, right from wrong. Duh, as I say. 
Of course it divides. Paul has this problem in the Corinthian church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, here's what he says. Look at 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1. I, my Paul, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. There's this uh, critique of Paul, that Paul has the wrong intentions and wrong ambitions in the ways that he uh, proceeds through the ministry that God has given him. And what happens, uh, just like in Galatians, there are false teachers, false brothers who come in and are now critiquing Paul's ministry methods and Paul's ministry convictions. Even worse, Paul's ministry motivations. And he says, look, I'm humble. I'll be bold in present if I need to be bold in present. Look at 4, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. There was a young man who asked me years ago, uh, Steve, what do you do about strongholds for sin? And I had took him to this text. I said, here's how the Bible defines strongholds. Areas of security and power and fortresses. Look at what he says. Look at verse 5. We destroy arguments. Well, an argument doesn't seem like a big deal. We destroy every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought kept, every thought, that there's a war going on at the level of your understanding and your theology about how you know and understand the person and work of Jesus Christ? Is that what you're saying, Paul? That's exactly what he's saying. We take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. He's talking about making sure the church is pure and that those who would assault Paul's motivations and Paul's methodology and Paul's ambition to please the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would be evaluated not by Paul's uh, fanciful, pragmatic methodology, but they would be evaluated by every truth, every thought, every argument being held captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, does that work? That is the mental work of the Christian, that we are evaluating things that either uh, exalt Christ or are raised up against Christ. They are distinctly Christian, or they're distinctly unchristian. And Paul says that's the battle in the church. Paul tells Timothy the church is the pillar and the, or the uh, pillar and the buttress of the truth, that it supports and it holds up the truth of God. So let's apply this real quick. This may be a little bit of a tricky one for you because typically none of us want to say, well, I am actively believing lies right now. Right? You, pro- that, you probably didn't make that statement this week. You may, if you're you a Christian and you read the word of God, you are probably have an ambition to know and to understand Jesus and who he is and what he's done and how that applies to your life. All of that is awesome. But one of the things as I thought about this was dis- be, being able as a Christian to distinguish not just truth from lies or truth from deception, but I recognize this uh, in the ways that I have a tendency to fantasize that I have a tendency to dream, where I have a tendency in my life to disconnect truth from the way that I think things ought to be. See, worriers are great dreamers. They dream in vivid imagination. They can see how things are going to go disastrously wrong but they always dream in nightmares. You with me? You know that about your worries, that they always have a sense of, I'm going to wake up and it's going to be bad. What happens when you wake up from a nightmare? you got to remember where you are, who you are, what are you doing, who's next to you, what is happening in my life right now, right? Because your nightmares capture your attention. They capture your mind's eye. And when you wake up, you've got to reorient. So Paul says the diet of the Christian, the mental diet of the Christian is what is true. Are we able to evaluate and think about the things that are true and the things that are false and therefore make distinctions? We've got to be able to do that. Number two, whatever is honorable. Now, what a great word. This is probably a word you don't use very often, that she is a woman of honor. 
That sounds a little archaic, doesn't it? This word is used in other places in the scriptures always to talk about God's leaders in the church. Of deacons, deaconesses, elders, older men. It's translated in the NIV as noble, if you have an NIV Bible. It's translated in the, uh, the Net Bible as worthy of respect. Paul uses it to talk about those leaders in the church that they could carry themselves with dignity. Let me, let me give you an example here. This is from uh, Titus 2. Show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, and this word, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Um, see, honor captures this idea that we live our lives for something more important than what we desire that when you think of Medal of Honor recipients, that they did the hard thing in a tough day to rise above the circumstances, the suffering, and the difficulty to be the man or woman they were called to be in that scenario. See, honor captures our attention, doesn't it? it? That it creates an aspiring in us. And Paul says that's how the mind of the Christian ought to be thinking from what is true to what is honorable. So do you, is your mental diet, is there anything in your mental diet that stirs your heart for honorable things? You read biographies or watch biographies or things of great men and women in the faith that stir your ambition and your courage for Christ. that there ought to be an honorableness about our mental diet. Number three, whatever is just. Uh, This word is often translated righteous. It's used throughout Paul's writings in Romans to talk about um, righteousness. It's essentially an idea of God's standards, that how God engages his standards with humanity. Um, Paul talks about it. uh, He talks about the righteous by faith in the book of Romans chapter one. He says that God's law is holy, righteous, and good. Peter talks about those who are made righteous by Christ's obedience. Paul uses it in Romans to talk about uh, Abraham who, is, uh, who by faith was declared or reckoned or counted to be righteous. Uh, I've shared this story before. Um, there was a time when I was, uh, I was working and I heard through the grapevine that there was a, an individual who was far more mature, far more along in the path, far more accomplished than I was, and he had a negative opinion of me. And it ruined me for about six hours. And I went to the gym and I was muttering in my heart about this guy doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know how hard I work. He doesn't know how ambitious I am. He doesn't know how accomplished I am. He doesn't know how successful I'm going to be. I'm going to show him this guy has it out for me. He doesn't respect me as much as I think you ought to respect me. He's got a real problem. And uh, I left the gym. Remember going to the gym? Those were good times, weren't they? Those were good. We used to be fit, fast. You ever hurt yourself playing kickball with your kids? That was Saturday. I was driving in the car, and God uh, went after me in my heart. And I recognized that in that moment, I was clinging to standards about myself that were not God's standards about myself. I was clinging to standards that this individual had violated, in my opinion, that he did not respect or love Uh, me, the way I think I ought to be respected and loved, and I was consumed with him breaking my own personal standards. And I remember where I was in Mount Pleasant, driving around, uh, where God confronted me with that and said, Steve, your issue is that you need to repent over having a wrong standard. And the minute I repented, peace hit my life. And I was able to move on from this scenario that would have given me an ulcer. It would have Uh, frustrated my life because uh, here's the point. Are you more consumed with your standards or are you more consumed with God's standards? 
Do you worry and get anxious about people not doing the things that you think they ought to be doing? Are you more concerned with the standards that God has set in his word and being concerned that people are breaking God's standard? That's a, man, that's a penetrating question, isn't it? Am I more consumed and focused on God's glory or my glory? When those barbs get into my heart, do I repent quickly and say, oh God? You know what, Proverbs says this, I think it's fascinating. Proverbs 28 says the, um, the evil men do not understand justice, but the righteous, uh, I'm sorry, those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Do you know what, what Solomon is saying? He's saying that when you really understand the holiness of God and how far that you have fallen from the standards of God, you are way more humble in your estimation of yourself. And Paul says our mental diet ought to be on those things that are just, that are righteous, that are the actual standards of God applied to humanity. You with me? That's why we care about sharing the gospel, right? If we don't believe that people are sinners and have no hope of coming to God on their own, but that God has bridged that gap and sent his son, the perfect and holy one, to die in our place to bring us to God, then we get far more serious about God's holy and righteous standards, don't we? Then we long to see people from every tribe and tongue brought into right relationship with the God of heaven and earth because we have a right understanding of the standards of God, of those things that are truly righteous, truly just. Number four, whatever is pure. Uh, Paul uses this in Philippians chapter one to talk about those who would preach Christ sincerely or insincerely. He says this, uh, the former people that he's talking about proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not this word, purely. This is Philippians 1, 15, uh, 17. Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So you can talk about pure, you can talk about sexual purity. This is the will of God for you. Thessalonians says that you abstain from sexual immorality. You can talk about pure motives, as Paul does here in Philippians chapter one. You can talk about pure uh, spiritual fidelity. Or Paul uses this again in 2 Corinthians 11. You can read it later, I won't make you turn there. But he says that uh, I am afraid that as, as, that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul recognizes that the battle that is being fought out there is a lot of times at the level of our devotion and love and service of Jesus Christ, that we would be pure as he is pure. That's not just morality. That's in uh, our pure relationship with him, that we have a single-minded devotion to him. Okay, now here's what... Um, let me apply that. Uh, when you're reading, listening, thinking, watching, are you feeding your mind with what is pure? Or is it just Netflix binge and whatever? Are you still watching? Are you still watching? Are you still watching? And like, you just kind of let the information come alongside in front of you. You just read thoughtlessly or carelessly with the things that you encounter. Be careful. You are being discipled. You know that, right? Whether you think it's authentic Christian discipleship or not, there is always an agenda put in front of you that would tempt you to believe it and to receive it with zero thought and reflection. My wife uh, used to uh, be involved in uh, essentially youth ministry. And from time to time, she would have to take um, kids that she was ministering to from event to event, and they would always want to listen to hip-hop. And they would go, oh, Miss Susie, can we put on the hip-hop in the car and listen to it? And she said, uh, no. What we're going to do in my car is listen to Christian hip-hop. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the words. And what she would do is she would stop the music that they wanted to play and go, what did they just say? Are the things that that individual is saying righteous and pure and godly and got Christ serving and Christ exalting? And she would say, no, in my car, we're going to listen to Christian hip hop. And we have several friends who are in the Christian hip hop world and uh, they would write really good music and, and it would allow her the opportunity to keep, the, to keep it hype. You know what I'm saying, Donna. Keep it hype. But at the same time, engage it with biblical truth. 
so that she was cognizant of the things that, uh, that, that she was listening to that would allow her conversation over really true, pure, just, righteous kinds of things. So what's the, what's the point? If you need good hip-hop, talk to Suzanne. <laughs> Donna, you know what I'm talking about? Holly, Kendra, you, if you need good hip-hop, talk to Suzanne. She'll disciple you in that, I promise. Uh, but it, look, you can't do it thoughtlessly. You engage your mind. I see this all the time. My kids will do this at the table where they're always pushing the boundaries of what's appropriate. Right? If you have young kids, you know that they are always pushing the boundaries at the dinner table about appropriate conversation. And we're trying to discipline them back into thinking and planning and considering righteousness, truth, purity. And it takes us doing that work. You know this if you have kids. I know this in my family, that when we did, uh, when Addison taught Psalm 63, I had all my girls here with me. And on the drive home, I said, all right, what did Addison say today? And I always do this with my kids. When I'm, when I'm discipling my kids and I'm talking to them, I'm reading them the scriptures, I'm always forcing them and asking them questions to engage their minds so that they think about the truths that Jesus is saying. And we took Psalm 63, and I wrote a hilarious dad song about Psalm 63 that now my kids at home right now who are watching online could sing for you. Because it matters to me that my children engage their Christian faith with their mind. When I disciple young men in our church, I give them books and I make them write a response to the book because I want to know if they can think through the issues. Do you think that matters for your kids? That your kids are, don't just get launched out into the culture but are able to engage the culture with purity of thought and reason and logic? That's what the Bible is filled with. That's why we started with Matthew chapter 6. Look at the birds. Consider the lilies. Use your brain and connect spiritual truth to physical truth. Put them together. All right, now let's, uh, let's keep going. <clears throat> now, what Paul's going to do, he's going to use uh, words that are no longer found in the biblical literature. He's going to use two more that are only used one time, and he only uses them here. And, and commentators think that what Paul is doing is now moving from the doctrines of the church into society. And he's moving into arenas where the Philippians would see things and understand things and understand the cultural values that are around them. Look at what he says, whatever is lovely. The NIV translated, it translates it as admirable. Another translation says it like this, everything that we love. It throws out the, the term broadly so that it would, it would look in a culture and say, what are the things that are highly valued and prized by the culture? Now, that's a little dangerous of a question, right? I get that. But Paul is saying that cultures carry echoes of the truth of God. You know what I'm saying by that? That, that you can see echoes of a culture and the way that it governs and organizes itself that can get you back to the headwaters of the truth of God's word. And Paul says, whatever is lovely. The next one, whatever is commendable, also a word uh, that kind of probably talks about admirable in the eyes of others. So you're seeing how subjective they are, lovely things, artistic things, beautiful things, right? They only hang certain works of arts and uh, art in the Louvre. And Paul recognizes these echoes in a culture of the truth of God's word. If there is, he goes on, uh, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, We should be savvy enough with our Bibles in our hands to identify beauty, loveliness, commendable things in our culture. Now, listen, we, we know as the church and as God's people that not everything that is commendable in our culture is commendable in the church, right? Right, thank you, okay, right? We know that. So we have our Bible in our hand, but one of the dangers, I think, for Christians is that we engage the culture with this really... A critiquing kind of eye. 
And apart from the fact that very few people have been critiqued into knowing, loving, and serving Jesus, that we have a hard time being able to identify truly beautiful things. That we know as Christians that our culture is broken. We know that people are addicted and self-serving and darkened to the knowledge of God. But we also know that this world is made by God and it carries a divine imprint of who he is. That we're broken and we're shattered, but when God made it, he made it good. And a lot of times, for you and, and for me, that, uh, that I don't want to live my life in this world with this constant, like, Scrooge mentality. You know who Scrooge is? This kind of, like, grumbling, well, it's all broken out there. I can't see anything good. And I, look, I get the temptation because, man, what, as I think about this text, one of my temptations is not so much to deal with my mental diet as in uh, repenting from evil things. I have to take this text and I have to repent of the medium things, the innocuous things, the distracting things, that I don't lead my mind all the way to what is true and what is pure and what is just and what is honorable. And that's the command. It's not to think about the dirty and the broken and the dark less and just get it dim. It's to direct our minds to the wonderful, to the beautiful, to the things that are worthy of our meditation and our affection and our attention. It's to take our minds from the gutter to the heights. And so often I get stuck, you know, right about, it's, you know, it's all right, life's okay. I think about okay things. I think about generally inoffensive things. I think about things that make me feel good, but not necessarily things that pull my mind to the heights and the truth of God's word, the heights and the truth of who God is. That I can carry within me sort of a cultural cynicism, but I can't get from what I see in a culture back into the spring of God's word the spring of God's character. And that's what I want for me. That's what I want for you. You know, oftentimes my family will go to the beach and we'll stand at the beach and you'll, you'll look at the beach and you'll see the curvature of the earth, you know, as you look across the horizon. And it's a really resetting thing for my wife, Suzanne, as we go to the beach. Like all of our kids are engaged. They're not fighting or yelling. They're all engaged in what's happening at the beach. And it's this moment where as you look at the curvature of the earth, you know, and the, the 180 degree breadth of our life and our thought, that your mind is, is drawn back to the garden. It's drawn back to biblical truths where Proverbs says that he inscribes a circle on the face of the deep. And the psalm says he, he hangs the earth on nothing. Or Job says that. And, and my ambition for you in our church, one of the reasons I am so particular about verse-by-verse -verse exposition is I believe you and I need the truth of God. We aren't here necessarily for a fantastic experience. Psalm 90 says we got 70, maybe 80 years, and we're done. And my ambition for you, my desire for you and our church is that we would create opportunities for true maturity to happen here to where we would encourage one another to direct our minds to truly beautiful, lovely, commendable, truth, purity, justice, honor kinds of things. Because you and I know, we, we know when we leave this place, we're not gonna find it. You're gonna find echoes of it. So my ambition when we teach and we preach the truth of God's word is that you, as much as God will allow, and as much as I pray for the Spirit to do this, that, that he would draw your minds in, our, in this time together and in the relationships with others in our church to the truly beautiful one, Jesus Christ. That as a result of our time together, you would get a sense of who Jesus is in the heart to go, he is the true one. He's the pure one. He's the honorable one. He's the just one. 
He's the one in whom there is all excellence. That he is the commendable one. That he is the one who is worthy of praise. And that only comes by doing what Paul says here. So I'm going to bring the band up here. And we're going to finish our time in prayer. Asking God to do that among us. I want that. I hope you want that when you come to church. That you would come to this place with the word of God open, eager to hear what God would say. I want to read you this. This is from uh, Ephesians, just uh, one book over. Paul recognizes that this is a tension in every church. And Paul, as he applies the letters that he writes, always does it by pulling your ambition into spiritual courage and the heights of God. And he does this in Ephesians chapter 5 like this. He says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now watch this. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must, must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Do you think our morality ought to be different in here than out there? You think our convictions about the way we treat each other ought to be different in here than it is out there? Let there there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking with your out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And this is a verse that you can memorize. Let no one deceive you with empty words that this would be a place, this pulpit would be a place where the truth of God shines forth like a light in our city. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would give us that ambition, that the joy of our hearts would be learning and understanding the things that are pleasing to you. Would you give us a hunger for your word? Would you please give us in this place a desire to engage and love you with our minds? For those who come and are deceived about their situation, Father, I pray the truth of God would shine like light, would illumine the darkness. And for those of us who know you and follow you, I pray that we would be stirred with courage toward taking our next step to knowing you deeper, to knowing the truth and the purity, the honor and the justice of your name. Father, make us winsome in our relationships. That we would have the ability and the capacity and the discernment to know how to make our way back to the pure spring of God's word. And as we come as warriors and as anxious hearts and we are in this place here, we give thanks for Jesus who died for warriors. Jesus died for those who who didn't know how to understand him, who didn't understand what he was doing and who he was and who understood him in a limited way. But Father, your goodness to us in the scriptures and in your word guides us to a proper understanding of Christ. He is our hope and our salvation. He is wisdom from God, Paul says. And it's in his name that we pray. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen.